All right, everybody, welcome back to Contemporary American Literature. Uh, this week we are talking about, well, what, I, what I'm calling it is post-postmodern <laughs> poetry and nonfiction. So post-postmodernism is not a uh, very, it's not a phrase that rolls off the tongue, nor does it really name anything real. So this isn't a, sorry, this is not a very heartening way to begin. This isn't a week with a strong theme in some of the ways that some of the other weeks in the class have very strong themes. We're going to look at some poetry and nonfiction from, we're going to be sort of all over the place time-wise, from the 70s up through the 2000s. Um, and I, it's kind of a survey of some poetry and influential poetry and nonfiction of the late 20th and early 21st century by some of the major figures in those two genres, uh, particularly nonfiction, the nonfiction genre I'm concerned with this week is memoir, so really poetry and memoir. And what I mean by post-postmodern is the following. I think that all of the writers we're going to read this week, the three poets and two memoirists, are influenced by questions raised by postmodernism in ways that writers who were writing maybe before postmodernism would not have been. And yet I don't really think of these writers, with the possible exception of Spiegelman, as fully postmodern themselves. They're not postmodernists in a kind of obvious textbook sense in the way that a Philip K. Dick or a John Ashbery or a Thomas Pinjohn can seem. Uh, but nonetheless, they're informed by these issues. Now, the, what, we're, it's, what I'm not saying is what we're going to encounter in the last two weeks of the course, uh, which is anti-postmodern writing. We're going to encounter writers next week and the following week, such as David Foster Wallace or Jennifer Egan, who I think are actually writing against postmodernism, uh, rejecting it on, on grounds aesthetic or ethical or political or, or all three. I don't think we're seeing that here. I think we're seeing writers who are actually concerned in a lot of ways with other things, uh, especially the poets, uh, concerned with things that are not necessarily the postmodernists' concerns, and yet they know that they have to take into account what postmodernism had to say about language, about representation, about uh, about si simulacrum, etc. And, and I'll go through what I mean by this in each particular case. Um, my illustration on the slide, I thought since we have, uh, we only have one comic book artist uh, in this course. Of course, there could be, there are many more, there could be many more. Uh, the graphic novel becomes a, an important literary form at the end of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st century, but the, in our anthology we're only given one selection from a graphic novel, um, and I, I tend to imagine that there will be more uh, such things as this anthology is revised and as graphic novels become a bigger part of literary education. But I thought since we do have one graphic novelist, I would give another sample of his work. So this is a panel from his graphic memoir, Mouse, which we'll discuss in some detail later uh, this week, in which the author, so you, if you, you read the work, so you'll know that he pictures uh, himself and other Jewish people as mice. And there's a scene, not in the selection you were given in the anthology, in which he pictures himself as a man wearing a mouse mask, drawing at his drawing board, his drawing table, on a pile of mouse corpses representing the victims of the Holocaust. And what's going on in this scene of the work is he's expressing his guilt that is he kind of... Um, using this tragic event that befell his family to profit himself as an artist and uh and is his is his representation a kind of masquerade to benefit himself even as he pretends in his fear to be concerned about this event is he not rather exploiting it and i think that's what we mean that's what I mean when I say that he's not a postmodernist in a strict sense because he's actually trying to recover and transmit the truth of what happened to his family in this world historically catastrophic event on the one hand. And yet on the other hand, in doing that, he's forced to ask himself, 
all of these questions that are metafictional, or in his case, meta nonfictional, about the ethics of representation and how do we, uh, how can we judge what is an ethical representation? So he's constantly drawn back to that um, postmodern quality of the meta analysis of his own text, not because he doesn't think you can reach the truth, but because he does want to reach the truth and he's so concerned about if that's even humanly possible. And so that is what I mean by a post-postmodern writer or a post-postmodern text. I don't think he's fully postmodern in the way that Grace Paley was when she says in a conversation with my father, there's this kind of infinitude of possibility. Uh, everything is radically open or radically uncertain, as we saw in Ursula K. Le Guin's work. He's not that. I think he, he has a very delimited project of investigating a real event that it would be uh, ethically monstrous to deny was a real event. And yet, even in this exploration, he's forced to bring these questions that postmodernists ask to his work. And I think, I think he's actually the strongest example of this of all the writers we're reading, uh, though Kingston does something similar in words without pictures. But I think that that goes for so many of the writers of this period who are not postmodernists, but are forced to ask postmodern questions. So we're going to read five authors this week. Um, three poets, two memoir writers, and uh, and I think I'm just going to do five relatively short lectures instead of doing uh, longer ones. So uh, this this is a preamble to a lecture on uh, Lee Young Lee, who we're going to get to in a moment, and then there will be four subsequent brief lectures on Frank Bedart, Louise Glick, Maxine Hong Kingston, and Art Spiegelman. So with that preamble given, let's get into the work of Lee Young Lee. So. Li Young Li uh, is the first of the three poets we're going to consider. Uh, I think there are three poets that resemble each other in a lot of ways, resemble one another in a lot of ways. Um, and, uh, and they were all sort of prominent around the same time, uh, not quite members of the same generation, but all prominent in late 20th and early 21st century poetry, and I think have some shared concerns and some shared styles. So Li Young Li uh, has a very interesting background. He was born in 1957 in Jakarta, Indonesia, to uh, Chinese parents who were from very prominent and well-connected families. So his great grandfather, <coughs> excuse me, was the first president of the Republic of China, and his father had been a personal physician to uh, to Chairman Mao, the leader of the Chinese Communist Party and leader of China from 1949 to 1976. But they eventually got exiled, I think, in the uh, a lot of the ideological tumult and chaos of, uh, of, of, of Mao's successive revolutions. And so they ended up in uh, Jakarta, where I think his father was instrumental in founding a university there. And then they fled Indonesia because there was a great deal of anti-Chinese prejudice there, uh, as I understand it. And then they went first to Hong Kong, which was independent of China at the time, then to Japan, and then they make their way to the United States in 1964. So his early life is marked by this, this wandering, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, through various countries and various cultures. They end up in uh, the United States. They end up in a town in western Pennsylvania, so near Pittsburgh, where we saw August uh, Wilson being from. But it was a small town where Lee's father was a minister and was running a church. And uh, that is something... I don't think they emphasize the bio of Lee. is very short in the Norton Anthology. Uh, it doesn't go into a great deal of detail, but my understanding is that he's a substantially religious writer. Uh, I was looking, I was just looking up. I'm, I mentioned at the beginning of the semester when you teach it from an anthology like this um, and you're teaching a wide range of writers, you run into some writers that you're very familiar with uh, and we've seen some of those that I know very well and told you all about their work, uh, probably at too much length. But then also you run into some writers you're not as familiar with. And I had not been quite as familiar with Lee Young Lee, so I was researching him, uh, reading some interviews this weekend, and he's very much, a, I think, considers himself a religious writer, and he talks about how uh, poetry for him comes from God, 
and uh, and he does this in a in a multi he's a multicultural writer as well because for him he looks to Christian traditions he looks to uh, to Buddhist traditions uh, he speaks of uh, uh, poetry as being a kind of yoga like practice uh, but he also talks about it as uh, in terms of Christian Protestant mystics like Meister Eckhart so but he is substantially a religious poet and I think that's a clear differentiation I think from a lot of the postmodernist writers because postmodernism is often the most secular really of uh, of ways of thinking that that human beings are just living in a radically meaningless uncertain cosmos so um, to to focus on uh, to focus on uh, to God, he speaks of some of his poems as a lo as love letters to God. I think is not what I would consider necessarily. Well, I, I shouldn't. Do, there is such a thing as postmodern theology. I know that exists, but generally, I in the common view of what postmodernism is, it, it often feels like the most secular of philosophies. So. Just a little background there, and then he attended uh, the University of Pittsburgh, as I did, uh, then the University of Arizona, which I did not attend, and then the State University of New York at Brockport, and has taught at several universities, including Iowa, and is married with two children and lives in Chicago. He started publishing his poetry in the 80s. He's published five books of poetry and a memoir since then, and has won multiple awards and fellowships. Um, they talk in the biography of him in the Norton, which, as I said, was very short, about a tension in his work between memory and poetry. So memory is often sweet. It draws the poet to the past, uh, even when that sweetness is as dizzying as the juice of a rotten pear into which a hornet spins, or in which a hornet spins. Uh, but memory can also be a burden, and its pull is countered in Lee's work by a sensuous apprehension of the present. And uh, and they also mention that he writes a lot about his father, obviously just from the little biographical sketch I gave uh, you earlier. You could tell that his father was a very interesting person and a very commanding presence, I assume. So I think we see all of these things in Persimmon, uh, Persimmons. We see his, uh, his, his me it's based on several memories uh, that he kind of intercuts together. We have this portrayal of his father. We have this sensuous apprehension, both of objects in the world, such as Persimmons themselves, but also of language, which is where I think a postmodern influence comes in. And uh, this poem is, a not, is not in any obvious way religious, and yet there is, I think, a sense of the kind of holiness of the world. So the three poems I assigned by these three poets, Lee, Bedart, and Glick, are all fairly long. And with Bedart and Glick, I think they're too long for me to read them out loud. I do want to read all of Persimmons out loud. I'm going to do that now. I did not put the whole poem on a slide because it's, uh, it's kind of long and I didn't want to crowd the slide. I'm going to read the whole poem to you so you can just listen. And then I want to look at two particular passages to point some things out about them. So I just have the book here. I'm going to read it out loud. So Persimmons. In sixth grade, Mrs. Walker slapped the back of my head and made me stand in the corner for not knowing the difference between persimmon and precision. How to choose persimmons. This is precision. Ripe ones are soft and brown spotted. Sniff the bottoms. The sweet one will be fragrant. How to eat. Put the knife away. Lay down the newspaper. Peel the skin tenderly, not to tear the meat. Chew the skin, suck it, and swallow. Now eat the meat of the fruit, to so sweet, all of it, to the heart. Donna undresses. Her stomach is white. In the yard, dewy and shivering with crickets, we lie naked, face up, face down. I teach her Chinese. Crickets, chew, chew. Do, I've forgotten. Naked, I've forgotten. Niwo, you and me. I part her legs, remember to tell her she is beautiful as the moon. Other words that got me into trouble were fight and fright, wren and yarn. Fight was what I did when I was frightened. Fright was what I felt when I was fighting. Wrens are small, plain birds. Yarn is what one knits with. Wrens are soft as yarn. My mother made birds out of yarn. I loved to watch her tie the stuff, a bird, a rabbit, a wee man. 
Mrs. Walker brought a persimmon to class and cut it up so everyone could taste a Chinese apple. Knowing it wasn't ripe or sweet, I didn't, but I watched the other faces. My mother said every persimmon has a sun inside, something golden, glowing, warm as my face. Once in a cellar, I found two wrapped in newspaper, forgotten and not yet ripe. I took them and set both on my bedroom window sill, where each morning a cardinal sang, The Sun, The Sun. Finally understanding he was going blind, my father sat up all one night waiting for a song, a ghost. I gave him the persimmons, swelled, heavy as sadness and sweet as love. This year, in the muddy lighting of my parents' cellar, I rummage, looking for something I lost. My father sits on the tired wooden stairs, black cane between his knees, hand over hand, gripping the handle. He's so happy that I've come home. I ask how his eyes are, a stupid question. All gone, he answers. Under some blankets, I find a box. Inside the box, I find three scrolls. I sit behind him and untie three paintings by my father. Hibiscus leaf and a white flower, two cats preening, two persimmons, so full they want to drop from the cloth. He raises both hands to touch the cloth, asks, which is this? This is persimmons, father. Oh, the feel of the wolf tail on the silk, the strength, the tense precision in the wrist. I painted them hundreds of times, eyes closed. These I painted blind. Some things never leave a person. Scent of the hair of one you love. The texture of persimmons in your palm. The ripe weight. So, as you see, Lee brings a number of things together there. He brings a recollection of his education and a fight he had with a teacher. He brings together a recollection of his uh, relationship with his father, who was a painter, and who painted persimmons, just as Lee is writing about persimmons, and just as his teacher had scolded him for, for sort of misspeaking. And we see there <clears throat> one of the other ways in which I think uh, <clears throat> Lee and Bedart and Glick are post-postmodern writers is the way they handle broadly speaking, social, political, identity politics issues, because they do handle them. These issues do arise in their work. And there are things to be said in the register of identity politics about the writing of Lee as a Chinese American man, or Bedart as a gay man, or Glick as a Jewish woman. And these things do arise, but they're not poem poets that put those issues right in the foreground. In contrast to some of the writers we were looking at from the 60s and 70s um, coming out of the liberation and, and movements, the multiculturalist movements, writers like Adrian Rich or Ishmael Reed or Gloria Anseldua, who will put a political argument right up uh, in your face uh, deliberately as part of their aesthetic. Their aesthetic is this openly political and polemical style. We don't see that in Lee and Bedart and uh, and especially Glick. They 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 can feel and again especially Glick they can feel apolitical, and yet they thread these issues through their work. So we have this encounter, narrated, dramatized in the early part of the poem between the speaker, who presumably reflects the immigrant experience of Lee, in this kind of conflict with his teacher who seems to be rather uh, brutally and ignorantly uh, correcting his language, even as she doesn't know much about his culture, as shown in her treatment of, of persimmon. So we have that recollection at the beginning, the recollection of his father, from whom he sort of inherits this artistic vocation toward the things of this world at the end. And then in the middle, we have some of his own reflections on language as a poet, and we also have his recollection of, uh, of his experience with a lover, which balances out his experience with the teacher because with the lover, with his lover Donna, he teaches her Chinese, and they seem to have a mutual and reciprocal relation rather than the, the dominative relation between himself and the, and the teacher. So in that way, it's this very complex poem of many parts that fit together. So I just want to focus on two passages. Um, so I already talked about the, the first stanza about his encounter with this school teacher, Mrs. Walker. 
and how that fits thematically into the poem. But one of the things, we haven't uh, talked enough, I think, in this class about the form of poetry. I said that a lot of the poetry we read, or most of it, would be free verse, and that's true, but there's a lot of techniques within free verse you a poet has to differentiate poetry from just prose. And I think we see that in Lee, particularly in the second stanza, when he, it's true that he doesn't use a regular meter, so a regular pattern of stressed and unstressed syllables that creates a predictable rhythm. He doesn't use that, nor does he use a particular rhyme scheme nor does the poem really rhyme at all. It's free verse, the lines vary in length, they vary in how they end, and yet he uses these, what I call the sound techniques of poetry. So he says, persimmons, this is precision, and we see these recurrent sounds of the, uh, the short I sound and the S sound. Ripe ones are soft and brown spotted, sniff the bottoms. So bottoms spotted. That's kind of a slant rhyme, an off rhyme. It doesn't quite rhyme. We have alliteration. We have consonants where consonants sound together, the, the T's in spotted and bottom, and we have assonance where the vowel sounds sound together, the O's in spotted and bottoms. Um, put the knife away. Lay down newspaper. Eat the meat of the fruit. So we have these internal rhymes. So, and you can trace these sound techniques throughout the poem. So he does unite the poem through sound, even through rhyme, but he doesn't do it in a traditional way because he's writing poetry at the end of the 20th century after uh, a lot of the formal verse of the earlier centuries had drained away from poetry for reasons we discussed at the beginning of the class. And you can also see that he is, and this is again something they didn't really tell you in the Norton bio, but that I found through looking up some, some of his other writings online, is that he's very multicultural in his influences, that he's very influenced by European and American poets that came before, whether the German poet Rilke or American poets like uh, William Carlos Williams or T.S. Eliot from the modernist era, but he's also influenced by classical Chinese poets like Li Bai and Du Fu. And so he's bringing into his poetry this multicultural range of influences that you can see in his work. And then the final point I want to make about the passage on the right of the slide is uh, this is where I think you really see a postmodern influence in a writer who is not otherwise obviously postmodern. When he says, other words that got me into trouble were fight and fright, ren and yarn. Fight was what I did when I was frightened. Fright was what I felt when I was fighting. Wrens are small, plain birds. Yarn is what one knits with. Wrens are soft as yarn. My mother made birds out of yarn. So here's his, presumably he's getting in trouble again with his teacher, who's impatient with his learning of what is presumably his second or maybe even uh, third language. And so she's sort of berating him for mixing up words. And his point, though, is a very postmodern one, which is that <clears throat> these words that seem very distinct from each other actually slide into each other in terms not only of sound, but of meaning. So, one, uh, so postmodern language theorists have this view of language that each word means what it means by virtue of its difference from other words in the language, not because it has any privileged relation to reality. So fight is only fright because it sounds different. But, and, and I think that uh, Lee is kind of agreeing with this, but he's saying these words are also related in meaning in ways that the poet, the artist, people like himself and his father can perceive. Fight is related to fright. You uh, fight when you're frightened, and you're frightened when you're fighting. And he says that wren and yarn are likewise related. Wrens are small, plain birds. Yarn is what one knits with. Wrens are soft as yarn. My mother made birds out of yarn. So his teacher is saying to him, you have to separate these words. Uh, but he's saying, <clears throat> 
in a kind of postmodern gesture that no, the words are only different from each other by virtue of a superficial difference when in reality they and their meanings slide into one another as the poet uniquely can see. And that brings us to the end of the poem <clears throat> with the trope of the father's blindness that does not in fact prevent the father from being able to paint the persimmons. He says, I, can, I painted them blind, presumably meaning he didn't look because he had practiced so much. And so the poet, uh, and this is in many ways kind of a pre-postmodern, very traditionalist view of the poet, has these very special powers of perception that um, show you the connections between things that seem otherwise unrelated. And that's what he does in this poem. He brings these unrelated things together in this structure as a way of talking back to the teacher who told him you have to keep these things separate, you have to keep these things apart. And he's saying, no, you don't. No, actually, you do not. And that, I think, is the, is the, is the moral, if I can speak that way, of the poem which is informed by postmodern theories of language and difference, but also goes beyond them to set up the poet again as this kind of visionary uh, figure who is not merely at the mercy of language, but is shaping language and perception to reflect uh, the intricacy, the beauty of reality, which in some of Lee's other work is the ultimate reality of, of God. So that's Lee Young Lee, uh, and that'll be the end of this lecture. Thanks very much, and have a great day.